his long-term memory. Ask him where we're going, Jennifer. He'll make a joke, because he won't remember what you told him an hour ago. But now of you, Jennifer, with all the new layers of you that I hardly recognise myself, which shock me when I see you, the great womanish hips, those glasses, the lines when you frown. You won't remember that this evening. But how would I even start to say such a thing? She looks so enormously smug and cheerful, so apparently in charge. My daughter loves to drive. We drive. It's so flat hereabouts, we can see Bright Hill miles off, a round egg of gold downland, and the maze on it outlined in white like a thumbprint or a silicon chip. The lines are trenches, really, dug deep into the hill and filled with chalk. It must have taken Neolithic man a long, long time. And then, what did they do with it? What was it for? A sacred path? A mnemonic for a ritual? A tribal sign? No one knows exactly, though there are barrows everywhere around. And the design, as I will say in a moment, when he's prompted by the sight of it, retains its own potency. Look, Mum, says Jennifer, red kites. And I look up through the sunroof, and there they are, so very many of them, wheeling directly above me in a spiral, like leaves whirling down the drain. And then we are parking and get out into the day, which is golden and bright. Jeff says, marvellous, something marvellous. And Jennifer says, it is, Dad, it is, and looks at him adoringly, as she always has, as, as she does not look at me. And suddenly I feel angry and I let them go over the National Trust Lich Gate and up to the maze and sit down instead on the bench that's been thoughtfully provided for the elderly in the fur. There's always a wind up here. I listen to the dry noise it makes through the high grass and smell the hay and smell the hay and chalk smell. For a long time they thought the hippocampus was olfactory that it dealt with smell, but this is not true, or rather it's not mainly true. Smell is part of the memories the hippocampus makes. The smell of this hill has passed through my hippocampus and linked itself with the perhaps hundred times I've made this trip for my children. And now the scent again releases my children for me, lounging teenagers in old-fashioned jumpers leaning on the lich gate, ten-year-olds with flares chasing each other around the maze, toddlers tumbling, fat in nappies. All of these children are walking with Jennifer and Jeff up the hill, pacing the narrow, pale paths of the maze, and Jeff, the young father, goes with him, blunt, dark fringe falling over his eyes, talking as he goes about the possible meanings of this pattern, about the perfectly simple, perfectly mathematical route he's worked out to the centre of the maze, and the smell lets the complicated release mechanism of my love for him slowly, reluctantly click. I know what has happened to Jeff by my chart of absences, by the spade, not on the hook, the lawn, not mown, by the empty bag. I've been telling them to Jenny so she too can shade them in, and also to confirm them to myself, because each absence is so small. If she would listen, I would tell her that that is how the hippocampus was found out too, by its absence. There was a young man called Henry, patient H.M., America, the 50s. He had epilepsy, seizures to the point he couldn't work, might easily die, and in 1953, the year I had a tonsillectomy, was sent away to school. A surgeon called Scoville performed an experimental operation on HM. Scoville cut away most of the hippocampus and the rest of it atrophied, and that did cure HM's epilepsy. But when he woke up after the operation, he was amnesiac, and his amnesia was special, seahorse shaped. It was a woman doctor who studied HM, Dr. Brenda Milner. Patiently, steadily, she counted up all the things HM couldn't do. H.M. could remember the first 25 years of his life well, but not the two before the operation. He could recognise people from his past, but no one knew. Not Dr. Milner, not even carers he saw daily for 20 years. He could not remember new information. Facts such as a new president or a man landing on the moon were surprising each time he was told. But he could learn new things without knowing he was learning them. His procedural memory worked, but not his declarative memory. So Dr. Milner asked H.M. to join dots and a piece of paper into a star while he looked openly in the mirror, a particularly short of job. H.M. approached, and over three days he learned to get quicker and better at the task, but without ever remembering he'd done the task before. Jennifer and Jeff are near the centre of the maze now. Jeff ahead, Jennifer behind, both with their arms outstretched for balance on the narrow path like children. I can see already that if Jeff started off following his secret system, his famous code-cracking route to the centre, he's now forgotten it. They're heading for one of those infuriating twists of the maze which would turn me to the entrance. And I find I do not want Jennifer to notice this, after all. I find I want to be the fool here. I want her experiment to succeed. 
and so I start up towards them, thinking of something to say <coughs> against my old legs, perhaps. But Jeff has jumped over the grass to a different part of the maze, a big jump, like a little boy in a big ditch. And he's turning to encourage Jennifer to cheat too. Naughty daddy. I expect he's laughing. I keep walking. No doubt, Jennifer would have it that I am jealous of women like Brenda Milner, women who are fulfilled, who've used their brains to make a lasting impression on the world. But she's wrong. I like to think of her, older than me and cleverer, but still in those terrible clothes we had in the 50s, the roll-on and stockings, sitting opposite H.M. in his mirror with her notepad as he struggled with his fiddly, heavy breathing, star drawing. Him with his pencil, her with a pen, the two of them shading into the field of human knowledge, stroke by stroke, the function of the human Campus, temporal lobes, superlative memory, the procedural memory. Steadily, calmly, filling in the hidden lines and pathways, the way the image of the memorial brass can be rubbed onto paper with black wax, the banana shapes become feet, the scattered uprights, legs. Besides, Brenda Milner was doing something for me. In his mirror, which I'm imagining as my own mother's mahogany-framed dressing table mirror, under his own frowning, unexpectedly aged reflection, H.M. traced a little map for the Alzheimer's patient, a map with all the awkwardness of mirror writing, a map with gaps in it, but the only one we have. Jennifer and Jeff are making a game of it now. They've abandoned the rules and are leaping from path to path, recklessly flinging up their arms. I can hear their laughter, thin ribbons. But when I reach the entrance to the maze, my declarative memory pops up like a butler with the news of how to tackle the puzzle. It says, and would you like to follow Jeff's route today? Jeff's declarative memory failed him today. His is a servant who's taken to drink, who takes longer and longer holidays, who appears dishevelled in the middle of the night, talking nonsense. And so, to honour Jeff, I take his route, starting with a long, counterintuitive swoop to the right. H.M.'s mother lived with him for 20 years after the operation, 20 years growing step by step, day by day, further and further from his recognition, as if he were docked in 1953 and she were passing away from him in a great ship. Did she dye her hair, perhaps, or dress in 40 suits to remain more the mother he knew from the first 27 years of her life? Was there a morning when he simply didn't know her, when he asked, perhaps, her name? Jennifer and Jeff are sitting in the centre of the maze now, a worn, grassy spot surrounded by white hooks of chalk. Jenny's head is up, her profile fully clear of her flesh. She looks like a girl. Jeff is talking. The path takes me away from them, then back. I follow it. H.M. stayed in his lonely station, washed up in his island in time for nearly 80 years. Jeff won't. In Alzheimer's, after the hippocampus, the whole brain shrinks, the frontal lobes, the long-term memory, the procedural memory, and all the time, insistently, the brainstem remembers how to read. When I arrive, no one congratulates me on solving the puzzle. Jeff doesn't even stop talking. I recognize the discourse, heaven and the essential self. It makes my point, you see, that a personality only exists in reaction to others, that is, as a result of part of memories, but always in a forward trajectory in time. As I say to my students, what will you talk about in heaven? What will you do in a perfected world? And no one has ever given me a decent answer. And suddenly I see that Jennifer is crying. I sit down beside her and pat the middle of her anorak back, the place you touch when you need to be kind. I hate to be right in that. And Jennifer sniffs and says, I think heaven is now, don't you think so, Mum? Then we all sit on a while in the sun, and Jeff says again, it is so wonderfully warm. It is. If you shut your eyes, you could take it for real heat, the generative heat of spring. You could forget that September is just the afterglow of summer, the impression on the eyes after the candles burn out. 